Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I thought I'd spend a little time here discussing a recent picture I took of SH-2-115 and its little brother down here at the bottom of the picture, SH-2-116. But mostly, we're going to focus on SH-2-116, or also known as Abel-71, a potential planetary nebula. The thing is, not everybody agrees that it's a planetary nebula, and some people think it's a Strömgren sphere, whatever that is. Let's get started. Well, if we're going to go on a road trip to find SH2-115, where the heck is it? This is an artist's conception of our galaxy as seen from above. Of course, we have a black hole at the center of our galaxy, and we're located down here about 25,600 light years away from the center of the galaxy. Now, the numbers going around this image here are the galactic longitude. So starting from our sun and pointing directly towards the center of our galaxy, that's galactic longitude zero degrees. And then you go to 30, 60, 90, and so on. SH2-115 has a galactic coordinate of 85 degrees, and so it's along a line roughly here, and at 7,500 light years away, that puts it about roughly here. So it's really not that far away when you compare it to the size of the galaxy and our distance from the center of the galaxy. Now, Abel 71 is a bit closer to us than SH2-115, as it appears in the photograph to be in front of the nebulosity associated with SH2-115. We just don't know, or at least I could not find a good reference for how far away Abel 71 actually is, but it's somewhere along this red line from the sun within the 7,500 light year distance. My image of SH2-115 was taken with my ASI-1600 and the Antlia RGB filters and the 3 nanometer SHO filters. I use the RGB filters to collect data just for the stars and then set those aside and blend them back into the nebula image later on. The 3 nanometer SHO filters are obviously what I'm using to capture the nebulosity of SH2-115, but when I was setting up the framing for this target, I noticed in Nina's framing assistant that there was this little guy down here here at the bottom if I just could shift my field of view a little bit and I'm glad I did I didn't know what that target was at the time but it certainly seemed interesting because out of nowhere there's this highly defined this is very precisely defined structure and I thought it'd be interesting to capture it and since then I found a little bit of a mystery associated with what it actually is and a little bit of the astronomy food fight that's been going on since its discovery back in 1955. So I thought, what the heck, let me go ahead and include that in my framing. Now, I'm actually pleased with the framing here that this image provides. It kind of looks like this dramatic rising or setting of a blue cloud in the distance over the horizon of a rocky rust-colored planet. So it does create a rather dramatic looking image for SH2-115 and I'm using my Explore Scientific ED-102 which is a 700 millimeter focal length refractor. I'm of course doing everything set up on my Skywatcher EQ-6R mount and all the guiding is done with an off-axis guider and the ASI-290. And This picture here is composed of about 8 hours per filter for the SHO filters and about 0.8 hours per filter for the RGB filters. But really what I want to do is turn our attention to this little guy here. It's got a very interesting structure to it. When I first looked at it, I noticed in the framing assistant that it's got these wings that almost imply a spiral type dynamics to it, when in fact that is not the case. But what is this? Is it a planetary nebula or just an H2 region? Back in 1955, George Abel, who was an astronomer with UCLA, came up with a list of nebula that he published in 1955 and provisionally classified them as planetary nebula. Now, this 1965 paper that I'm showing here and this image that he had and included in his 1965 paper also says that it continues to be provisionally classed as a planetary nebula, but you can quite clearly see the distinct spiral arms, for lack of a better term, the wings coming off of the nebula, which are kind of interesting. But he doesn't go so far as to insist that it is a planetary nebula. He does leave the door open a bit for it to be something other than a planetary nebula. But this is the thinking, at least as of 1965, that this nebula, Abel 71, is a planetary nebula. George Abel did a lot of work in his career with UCLA and is probably best known for his galaxy cluster catalog. If you go into Stellarium and look up Abel 71, Stellarium is going to take you to the galaxy cluster Abel 71, not this nebula. If you want to find this nebula, you're better off 
typing in SH2116, and then that will take you to this nebula, or just go to SH2115, and it's right there in the neighborhood. If you go on AstroBin, you'll see several folks who've published their pictures, like the one I have that show SH2115, and the little guy SH2116 in the photo as well. And some of those astrophotographers will mention that Abel 71 was once thought of as a planetary nebula, but it is no longer considered to be that. In fact, it's considered to be just a H2 region, but there's no other reference to that. I did find a reference, however, here in the galaxymap.org site where they say that Abel 71 is often described as a planetary nebula. However, a study performed in 1991 concluded that it was an H2 region. The interesting thing about this notation in the galaxymap.org site is that they go on to say that curiously, professional astronomers are ignoring this paper and continue to list Abel 71 as a planetary nebula. So that means we have to go a little bit further down the rabbit hole and go take a look at this 1991 paper. This is the title and abstract from that 1991 paper, and the objective of the authors was to take a look at four nebula, S153, S207, S211, and S212, and the S here, by the way, is Sharpless, not the Sharpless 2 catalog that we're familiar with, but the original Sharpless catalog, and they were looking at these nebula with the objective of collecting velocity data at various points around the cloud of each nebula, because after all, if it's a planetary nebula, that outer shell of gas should be expanded away from the star that expelled that gas from its atmosphere. They were also given a set of data for Abel 71 or A71 and you notice there's a footnote up here. The footnote is providing credit to the astronomer who gave them the data but also noting that they don't have velocity data for that particular nebula. They're just including it in the study because it seems very similar in particular to S207 in terms of its shape. They say here in the abstract and within the paper that they show that Abel Abel 71, A71, is not a planetary nebula, but instead is an H2 region. Let's look at the data they received from their colleague for A71. They had data from four different filters for Abel 71. In the HA data, you get a very strong signal, plus you get the background nebulosity from SH2115. They're using a nitrogen 2 filter. Now, nitrogen 2, I believe, has at least two lines that are within the visible spectrum. This particular nitrogen 2 line has a wavelength very close to what the H alpha is, but here you can see that you very clearly get the nebulosity of Abel 71, but you don't appear to see much of the nebulosity in SH2-115 beyond. And they have an S2 filter and an O3 filter. Now the data I get from my filters look like this. Of course, I don't have a nitrogen 2 filter, but my HA is very strong and I can certainly see some of the nebulosity from SH2-115 beyond. My sulfur signal is quite weak. It is there. I can see it here. I can see it both in the nebulosity of the SH2-115 behind, but also a bit for Abel 71. And then in O3, I actually get a pretty decent O3 signal, which, as expected, is a weak signal, but still it is fairly strong in this eight-hour exposure. They didn't see any O3 signal in the data they were given by their colleague for this particular nebula. However, if you go out and take a picture of it, you do get the O3 data. And furthermore, they referred to the H2 regions as Sturmgren spheres, which, darn it, led me down another rabbit hole. What the heck is a Sturmgren sphere? I'd never heard of that term before. Well, that took me back to 1939. In 1939, Bent Sturmgren was doing some research and following up on some observations that Struve and Elve, Elve was a graduate student of Struve at the time, and back in 1930, and they had discovered that, whoa, space is filled with hydrogen alpha. Why are we seeing this hydrogen alpha? Well, Bent Strumgren took up a pencil and decided to do some math and figure out why it is that we could be seeing these clouds of hydrogen alpha out there. He considered a hydrogen cloud of about three atoms per cubic centimeter surrounding an O-type, which is a very uh, energetic, large, uh, fast-living star, and discovered that as that star is streaming off UV radiation, the strength of that radiation can ionize the hydrogen in a roughly sphere-shaped region that has a diameter of about 650 light years. And that became known as the Sturmgren sphere. We don't often think of it, or at least I don't often hear of those that term being used, 
but that's what a Sturmgren sphere is, and of course we've all seen them. A good example of a Sturmgren sphere that we're all familiar with is the Rosette Nebula, where this outer boundary here would be the Sturmgren sphere. A planetary nebula is a bit different, of course. It's still ionized hydrogen, but it's an expanding shell of hydrogen that was expelled from the star's atmosphere as the star was in the initial throes of dying as a star. From the top level, a roughly static cloud of ionized hydrogen is a Schrömgren sphere, or H2 region, whereas an expanding shell of ionized hydrogen is associated with a planetary nebula, which is why the folks in the 1991 research paper were trying to measure the velocity at different points around these nebula to see if they could detect this outward expansion rate of that cloud and if they can't detect it then they're calling it an H2 region and if they can detect it then it must be a planetary nebula. But as you see in their paper the data they have for ABEL 71 doesn't include the radial velocity measurements. So let's go back to the 1991 paper and look at the two points that the authors used to conclude that ABEL 71 is an H2 region and not a planetary nebula. The first thing they say is that in their H-alpha data, they see that ABEL 71 has wings that are reminiscent of NGC 2359. Well, the wings they're referring to are these two structures here and here. And NGC 2359, some of you will recognize that as Thor's helmet. I have not taken an image of that, so I just pulled this off the web. But here are the wings that are associated with Thor's helmet. And these wings, to my mind, don't look anything like the wings that we're seeing off of ABEL 71. They do, however, look quite a bit like the wings we see coming off of the Rosette Nebula. These two, the wings coming from the Rosette Nebula, appear to be quite reminiscent of the wings we see coming from Thor's helmet and vice versa, but I don't see the resemblance of these wings to that of ABEL 71. It seems to me to be perfectly reasonable that the astrophysics mechanism responsible for producing these wings and these two nebula could be a different process than the astrophysical mechanism responsible for producing this feature. Let's just say that in the process of expelling the atmosphere from a star, it happened in two phases. Maybe there was an initial bipolar expulsion that expanded out, followed shortly by a monopolar expansion, leaving us with maybe a better defined wing over here and a better defined wing over here, but something that's kind of asymmetric as opposed to what we're seeing coming from Thor's helmet and from the Rosette Nebula. The second point that they mention is that they didn't see any O3 emission line in the data for ABEL 71. But in fact, in our data, we do see the oxygen-3 quite clearly, and yet they're not seeing any oxygen-3 in their plates. It makes me wonder if the oxygen-3 plate was simply labeled as S2 and vice versa. So when I look at these two points in the 1991 paper, the presence of wings that are reminiscent of other H2 regions, that one doesn't seem to be that convincing because the wings that I see on ABEL 71 look quite different from what we're seeing in Thor's helmet and the Rosette Nebula, and also that there is no O3 in the data for ABEL 71, when in fact, if you go out and take a picture of ABEL 71, you're going to see some O3, and that's why I have kind of a cyan or bluish center to my ABEL 71. It's that oxygen that's present that's giving us that color. Well, the food fight started back in 1955 when ABEL published a list of nebula, including his nebula number 71, that he provisionally classed as a planetary nebula based on its size and shape. He reaffirmed that in a paper he released in 1965 where he added some additional nebula that had been discovered since then. And in that 1965 paper, he goes through and tries to classify uh, different features of the 86 nebula he includes in his catalog. A 1991 paper reassessed Nebula 71 along with four other nebula, and the authors concluded that the wings that were apparent in Nebula 71 and the lack of O3 in the data meant that this was not a planetary nebula, but that it was instead an H2 region, otherwise known as a Sturmgren sphere. But when you actually compare the the structure of the wings that they're referring to for ABEL 71 and comparing that to the wings they refer to for the Thor's helmet, you find that there's no real similarity between those wings at all. And of course, you go out and take a picture of SH2116 or ABEL 71, you're going to see some oxygen. So maybe that's why professional astronomers have apparently ignored the conclusions of the 1991 paper. They just don't find it that convincing. Now, of course, I don't know if ABEL 71 is a planetary nebula or not. 
It just seems like the 1991 arguments for it being an H2 region just aren't that convincing after all. And finally, I want to apologize to the real astrophysicist. I just play one on YouTube. So it looks like the fight for Abel 71 as a planetary nebula lives on. Okay, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little view into the sausage making of astrophysics and astronomy and classification of some of the things that we take a picture of and take for granted. For now, clear skies, and there are plenty of Sturmgren spheres out there, so let's get cracking. See you next time.